Hey you guys. Um, so I'm going to be recording all of these videos for you separately. This will be the first one, right? Linked on the schedule. Uh, and I'll share my screen here. So this is going to be lecture 4A, right? You'll you'll have clicked on it. And um, this is going to get you situated with kind of uh, design fundamentals and vector art, which is going to be relating to our Illustrator program component. And uh, then I will also be going over this lecture uh, before we get to Monday. Uh, and reason being, like I could do it Monday, but I will also be doing a video on Project 4 introduction, right? All four of these pieces I will be doing separately so you can watch them at your own pace. And I want you to be able to have the context of this because Project 4 is a combination of, uh, you know, these two sections uh, of Illustrator and Adobe InDesign, right? So um, trying to organize. I look at my face here, so I moved it closer to my camera. Okay, so um, yeah, without further ado, let me get going here with this. And so this is to get you situated. There we go, had to get my notes up here. Um, so I cover this every semester. It's, I'm still gonna be delivering all of the same content I would for this section. Uh, however, our exercise will be limited. So, um, you know, kind of making a fresh new page for that so that um, it doesn't go in, as in depth as we really don't need. So, um, this section is really talking about using vectors um, to manipulate and creating graphical content for through vectors. Um, and then situating you guys for different elements of design to be uh, starting to focus on. And the second exercise will go into more depth on elements for um, the layout. Um, so there's a there's going to be a bunch of uh, I wouldn't say redundant content, but uh, both of these almost could be joined together in, in sort of like one lecture. Uh, this is the first semester doing this hybrid project, so I'm just keeping them separate for now. So. Uh, you know, you're going to be watching both pieces to get the full uh, bit of information. Uh, what's nice about this lecture, we will be uh, looking at some examples of like more historical context to kind of give you primer for, uh, you know, how how design is situated in um, in society. And uh, I will say that if you have not yet watched the Helvetica movie, uh, you should pause this now, go to the schedule and watch the Helvetica movie first. Uh, that's going to give you a much deeper context into design um, than these individual lectures will. So moving on here. So this is to contrast how vector is different than raster graphics. And I'm trying to find my mouse cursor here. No, I was going to make my uh, face larger in the corner. That's all right. So vector graphics, you can see here, um, depending on your quality, if your YouTube uh, is not in HD, you might need to update it to see the the quality here. However, the vector content 
you can see there's some sort of um, bounding box, right? Like selection bounding box. And what's being selected here is actually just a few vector points. Um, I, my mouse is invisible right now up there. Thank you, Keynote. Uh, it's a very... Um, so where his chin is up above, kind of where his lip is, there's a point on his lip. Uh, there's only one vector point there selected, and it's it's solid blue. So all of the rest are in white. They're outlined as vector points. Um, that'll be important once we get into the exercise. You can see you'll see the difference between white and blue. Um, however, main point here we're getting at is that the vector content is crisp. It's defined by these vectors that are mapped out. Whereas raster graphics is based on uh, individual pixels. So as the pixel mapping is, uh, or as your image is increasing, the pixel mapping has to fill that space, right? And what does it fill the space with? It has to do an approximation. Uh, it's a different format. So uh, to further that point about vector, Usually vectors are to establish uh, either lines or shapes. Generally, you'll see shapes. Uh, even this outline of um, Peter's entire chin and mouth, this entire black section, it you would look at it as a line. Oh, it's just a draw, you know, a drawn line. But in vector, as is right here, right now that we're looking at. It's actually an object. It's complete. There's a complete blue line around around the entire perimeter, uh, so it is actually an object. And that's another thing we'll look at when we get into Illustrator is that we can convert lines into shapes. So we'll we'll look at that as well for those of you interested. So, kind of going off that point about. Um, vector points can either be, or vector content can either be lines or shapes, is this notion that there are, what's the, the proper term, um, vector points, endpoints, no, the arms, um, I'm slipping my mind here now. There's little arms that come off of vec some vector points that have curves. Uh, so these curved line, oh, uh, Bezier curves. So um, that's just the technical term, a Bezier curve. But even in uh, Photoshop, when we use the pen tool and make those points, that's actually creating vector points. Then uh, when we did use the pen tool in Photoshop, we went through that process of going to the paths panel and um, you know, translating that path into a selection. Then we got that dotted fuzzy line that moved, right? So before we got the fuzzy line, that outline with dots, that was actually a vector selection. So um, you know, all these different Adobe programs, they do use different components through them to make it easier for us as the user uh, it's up to you guys to kind of understand the differences between the two. Okay. So I'm going to be articulating this throughout here. Uh, so individual, in, individual shapes are not uh, resolution dependent in vector. Now, if you think about that specifically, resolution dependent. That would be the image is depending on resolution. And resolution is your dimensions in pixels. That's what resolution is always going to be relating to, um, is your width and height specifically in pixels. OK, that is resolution. It's not width and height in uh, inches or anything like that. It's always going to be pixels. So when um, we're thinking about vector content, we are um, 
resolution independent. So we are not relying on pixels. These individual vector points are graphed out for us. And the program just remembers where those points are on the graph. So if the graph has to change in scale, those vector points just change mathematically, their location on a mathematical plane. And then the data, what's happening like inside of an object, right? Whether it's a gradient or a solid color, uh, those components are then filled in to uh, the program to show us on our display. So the easiest way I like to represent this kind of uh, scale changing thing, right? Like if we take a small image in Photoshop and blow it up, it's gonna be blurry. But if we take a small image that's vector-based in programs like Illustrator, uh, we can blow it up to like a billboard size and we will never see a pixelated component of that image. It will always be crisp on the whole way through. So uh, that's in relation to the different technology. It's based on a, a clear cut line. So uh, here's kind of like some comparisons on why you would use the two and the pros and cons of the two. Uh, biggest points being that the vector files usually take up little storage uh, because they're not storing individual pixels and in those individual pixel colors, right? Like the bit depth and all of these components. Um, but the files can be more complex because we're dealing with kind of mathematical formulas on the angles of our Bezier curves and so forth. Um, but it doesn't matter how complex it is to us. We don't see that you know, we don't see the uh, coding component to that. So usually vector-based content will be large solid areas of color, right? So that's why you often see, uh, if you see like cartoons and different things like that, uh, most likely you're gonna be in vector. Um, now that I think about, it, I'm using these <laughs> Family Guy images. I wonder if the early, Family Guy content was drawn or, you know, drawn in vectors or not. Because every time I look at that original, like, you know, first season, um, even like other, other uh, animations as well, like Simpsons or something, on a HD or 4K screen, it always does look fuzzy, right? And uh, it can just be that needs to be updated. But if it's not in, in vectors, that process is going to be much more complex. Um, just like turning a, a video shot in HD digitally to 4K, it's going to be challenging. Um, so anyway, using different programs and such. Uh, so the other beneficial uh, component here with Vector is it's really good. You'll see it for logos, um, text-based images, uh, scientific drawings, graphs, stuff where the specifics need to be um, crisp, right? You're, there's not going to be loss of translation through it. Um, so again, if we create a logo, for instance, um, that logo in vector, create in vector, will be much more versatile. So if you're going to use the logo on a business card, which is very small, or you're going to use the logo on the website or a sticker for the side of a car or a billboard, right? Um, you can, it, you could use it for whatever because it's not dependent on um, resolution on pixels. So um, I always assume the way I, articulate this makes sense. I always ask if there's questions. Nobody ends up having questions. Nobody states things to me. Everybody understands things in a different way. Uh, and it's kind of important for you guys to understand these two things because it's not just Photoshop and Illustrator that you're going to have to decipher when you would use uh, vectors versus when you would use raster-based content. 
Um, this stuff is in all different types of programs, uh, like CNC routing, uh, machining, right? Um, that could be in wood, metal, whatever material. Um, laser etching, so like cutting wood pieces out. Um, I believe 3D printing has, I actually haven't worked in 3D printing, but um, all of these elements kind of are like based on mathematical lines. So those that will be using vectors, right? So there's different circumstances where vectors are gonna be coming into play and it's good to know the differences. Um, the reason I bring this up that people don't ask questions, I used to give quizzes in this class and I know for a fact that um, I ask simply like, what is a vector? Even though nobody asked questions, everybody understood it. Um, people still didn't get, <laughs> so uh, students still did not uh, get those answers correct. And funny enough, I used to give that question on the Photoshop project. And then the second project was always gonna be the illustrator. I would have that question as a repeat question. So I had already given the description, I did a quiz, people got it wrong. I gave them the correct answer on the quiz. So they seen what the answer was. And then I repeated the question and they got it wrong again. So there's some sort of disconnect. I don't know if people are just not interested in the content they're studying. Like, right. Like if you're in this program, you should be um, understanding the tools you're using. So I just offer that up as a, um, uh, maybe not so much uh, a frustration with my own practices, like it's up to you guys to, to learn or not, but really more as um, trying to get you guys to come out of your shells a little bit more, like ask questions. If you don't know, ask a question. It doesn't have to be in class. You don't have to feel embarrassed. You can shoot me an email. Uh, you can meet with me in my office hour. So, all right, Move it, moving on. Uh, so here we can see... Um, This is, is actually resolution uh, independency, not dependency. So the title up there is wrong. Uh, but the whole point here is kind of showing you a zooming of a vector-based content in Illustrator to show that it's still, it's still crisp as we zoom in, okay? Um, so there are different file formats, just like all of our other Illustrator um, Adobe programs and .ai is our file format for uh, Illustrator. It is nice that we'll be getting back with um, this program and the InDesign program with being able to import content and the program will save that content, like encapsulate that content. So there's not going to be any issues with linking files and importing correctly, that sort of thing. So a um, little, bit, little bit less stress, I, I guess, on you guys. And so clearly, um, this is a list of file formats for vector. And illustrator.ai is obviously going to have that uh, capability. But then beyond that, um, the most common that will be used for vector-based uh, files is going to be an EPS file. Um, that's considered encapsulated PostScript. Well, what does that really mean? There's also, as you can see there, PostScript. So PostScript is a programming language used by programs uh, to mathematically define the objects. It is the fundamental math that's being done. Um, encapsulated is a self-contained file format exported from different programs uh, and can be easily imported into other design programs. So there's more data embedded into it for the kind of end user aspect, right? Like colors and so forth. Uh, there also is um, some capability in PDFs. I haven't used that, I don't know if ever, for vector content. So 
uh, you'd have to look up that process. But uh, Affinity Designer is also a uh, another tool similar to Illustrator. Uh, it is it is not free. It still costs, but it's a cheaper alternative. I dabbled with Affinity Designer. Um, after undergrad, I, I did a, a job, um, not training, um, like an interview process. It was a few day like trial run. And they had me play around with Affinity Designer. At that time, I, I knew Illustrator well, but I still, it was harder to grasp the Affinity Designer. I wasn't trained in it. I, was, I just threw myself in and played around. So there is differences, but it does fundamentally still deal with vector content. Um, so getting back into colors, this is just a recap here, uh, but it, it's a recap for good reason. So RGB is color-based for light, right? What you're looking at on the screen is based in RGB, red, green, and blue. And CMYK is for print. So uh, when we ultimately send our uh, final spreads to the printer, again, just like we did on the Photoshop project, it will be converted to CMYK in the printer. Um, unless we embed that profile, but that's beyond the scope of this class. Uh, the reason I kind of go back into this is that for design specifically, uh, programs like Illustrator do embed additional uh, accessibility features for designers. And these are to share, have the ability to share uh, files like across spanses of uh, space, right? Uh, like you can have a file designed here and print it out on a t-shirt, right? And then you can send that file to Japan and have them print out or to print out, um, maybe make shoes and the shoe color is going to have the exact same color as the shirt print, right? Like how do you sync that up? There's got to be standards other than just screens because all screens uh, are varied, right? They all look different. And if you guys aren't familiar, next time you go, got to go buy paint from the paint store. Um, if you're not familiar with this, those paint chips you're looking at, they're going to look different in the store versus at your house or versus when you walk outside. It's all based on uh, white balance. So they might have a little booth there. You can test the paint chips underneath of a, a light to kind of see what it would look like in those different environments. It's kind of a cheesy knockoff because your eyes actually adjust to white balance. So like right now in here, uh, this light to me is a little bit like amber looking, um, but you could have a blue light and the blue light, if I turn the blue light on, that would look blue because I've, my light, my eyes have adjusted to the yellow, this orange, the warmer. However, if my above light was on, it was blue, like a blue light, and this one was off for a long period. And then I turn this on, this would feel warm and, and, and um, you know, so your eyes do adjust. And the point being here is that those chips are more of a standardized system, right? The paint store knows that chip is going to produce that color paint. Same difference with spot colors. Um, they're used to kind of um, compare what's on the screen to what is physical, right? This analog to digital gap. And so within Illustrator, this is um, a preview of that. We can go to window swatch libraries and see different, um, different swatch libraries. And um, there's a whole there's a bunch of different categories of Pantone. So uh, this is well beyond anything you would do in school. But if you were to go into uh, any sort of company where you do have to have this cross-reference of color, right, producing different content and different types of mediums and so forth, you would have to get into this. So it's worth kind of knowing that programs like Illustrator support that. And uh, 
we can use any, you know, you can see this Pantone um, swatch guide here. As soon as you click on a swatch color, that'll fill up into your active color box. And then you could also uh, find similar colors and stuff. So we'll look at um, kind of uh, using this color guide to your advantage uh, as you do a design in Illustrator. Okay, so that's kind of like the encapsulation of um, vector primer for now. Uh, the rest of this is going to be getting into some movement stuff, uh, and then we'll recap. So uh, I usually just ask this question, like, who pays for art? And I ask in the class and let you guys think about it. So uh, if you want to, you could pause this and, and think about, get a couple answers, right? Who pays for art? So uh, pretty much anything you can come up with is going to be correct right? Anyone can really buy art. Uh, I bring this up though, um, not as an obvious analysis, but to then contrast how now we have these abilities to go out and buy things. Anyone does, assuming you have the capital, uh, but who bought things in the past, right? Who paid for the art in the past? And we're talking like three, 400 years ago, or even later, or I should say earlier, right? Uh, and then if you think about that, uh, it often ended up being whoever's in power. Who has the power? So that would be um, royalty and uh, rulers, right? Like kings, monarchs, uh, depending on the historical background of the civilization. Um, as we got towards more of the modern period, it shifted to uh, religion. So in the Western world, that would be churches, right? Uh, and that seems like obvious. Okay, well, why does that matter? Why does it matter for art, right? This class is digital art. Um, so it has to, we have to have some semblance of why art matters, right? And uh, this is important to bring up who pays for art because, um, you know, in the past when normal people, right, you and I, non-elitist non people, um, we weren't able to buy art. We couldn't afford it. We didn't have the uh, wealth, the capital to invest in that. And this is talking several hundred years ago, right? Like uh, 200 plus years ago. Uh, and because only a select portion of people could buy the art, that also changed or restricted what type of art was made, right? Uh, and nowadays you can have somebody twirl a paintbrush on a canvas and it might be modern art and sell for a lot of money. But, you know, several hundred years ago, the context is different. Not anybody can just do something and profit from it. Uh, somebody's got to want it. And it was a specific, you know, the world was different. The point being is that, uh, that work that was made traditionally ended up being uh, symbols of the interests behind those wealthy elite, such as um, their own self-portraits, religious connotations, um, idealistic representations of society, like, you know, think of like uh, Greek Roman statues, right? Uh, whatever was most important to that, those elites, right? So, and you want to think of, you want to think of art also at that, at that time is kind of like um, a representation of power. So not only did the elite uh, uh, commission this work or demand this work be done by artists, um, but that art then also served to um, 
solidify their power, right? Um, so it was really all about a, a power struggle. And so then how do we get to the point we're in now? That's what all of this talk is kind of going into. How are we getting into the, the period now? It uh, transitioned at the point of modern art. So modernism. Now, I want to make something clear here, and this is just kind of like your basic art history uh, context, but uh, modernism isn't to be confused with the modern era, like we live in a modern era. Uh, modernism is a specific title of a specific period in time, okay? So like um, uh, the era of the dinosaurs, right? That was a specific area, of, uh, a specific period of time. Modernism was also the specific period of time. And it was to highlight this transition between um, this, this uh, the power uh, between, you know, shifting from power from the elite to um, everyday people upholding more of their own agency. And there was a lot of different components that really, uh, you know, um, got up to this moment. But it was, uh, realistically, it was really behind um, different wars and movements where, uh, in, in the Western world, where uh, the people took back control of their own lives. Um, from the dictators, from the rulers, right? They um, established democracies and um, fought for those rights. So once people were able to work for their own selves through their own agency towards their own goals and means, um, over time, they developed their own income and ability to buy art uh, on a similar plane, artists um, were able to then um, create work that would sell right beyond uh, what was required of them to be making. And they could create an income and uh, you know sustain themselves off of whatever it is that they've done. And then once it got to the point these modern artists, right? So at the beginning, you could see here like 1830, uh, the art was used for that agency in developing uh, this push towards a modern era, this modernist, modernistic era where um, we're putting the power into the hands of the people, right? Uh, whereas once the power has been instated into the people and over time, um, artists had been able to um, live comfortably on their own means. Then we start to get into the area uh, of artists like Picasso, very common artist, right? Uh, really easy for reference. He was, uh, that, that era of people um, were able to sustain their own life, their own needs, to the point where they could start creating for their own self, right? This notion of a, an artist being able to create what they want to create. What are their interests? What are their passions? What are, you know, what concepts do they want to present? It's not just painting a king or otherwise you'll be beheaded, right? Uh, so this, this image of Picasso's here, uh, I believe it's at the Met. Uh, it might be at MoMA. I'm, I'm confusing the two. I think it's at MoMA, Museum, Museum of Modern Art, New York City. Uh, it's the first um, Cubist work. Consider the first Cubist work. Um, and Cubism, if anybody's heard the term before, kind of looks blocky, like Cubish, right? Uh, the point, the, the concept behind Cubism, just as an aside, uh, is that um, artists like Picasso, there's a whole group of artists, right? The Cubist movement, uh, where they try to represent three-dimensional 
um, shapes, objects, people, whatever, in a two-dimensional space by um, presenting those different perspectives, right, of something on the same plane. So if I had a camera off to the side here and a camera, you know, slightly this way, and I took a photo of both my faces and I overlaid them both into the same space, right? And you see both at the same time. That was that concept. This is before cameras, right? Before any kind of editing or anything like this. So, um, you know, moving on from this, 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 this uh, period in time where, uh, you know, artists were able to start to be more experimental and uh, more scientific and, uh, you know, improve their lives. Uh, we get into uh, a reflection of those artists, like how did they become successful? Ooh, you know, like how can we make, how can we get more people to be successful? And um, the uh, Bauhaus, um, everyone should know if you're continuing in the arts, is uh, a school that was founded by this Walter Gropius. He was a architect. Um, he designed that building actually, uh, but it was in Germany in 1926. Uh, and the Bauhaus was founded in 1919. Uh, the core objective was a radical concept. All disciplines in visual art, architecture and design were treated as uh, one. They were all in the same building. Um, this mode of operation broke traditional arts education. Uh, the traditional education was just like, okay, you're going to go to school for three years. You're going to learn how to draw. There's still places in this, in the, in the world that do this, right? You focus on the fundamentals of what art is. You need to learn how to draw very well. And then after you have those fundamentals down to a T, you're very well situated. Then you can decide what avenue you're going to explore for your, for your, um, your own practice. Um, so uh, breaking this traditional concept, uh, arts education uh, evolved through this notion of the Bauhaus and uh, allowed for schools like this now today, where we can go out and study different, uh, different, um, aspects of art or design or computer science or architecture and bring those ideas together and collaborate with different people on those topics. Right. Uh, so that's kind of how this started. It was like engineers and art and artists and designers and uh, scientists all came together to collaborate. So it's very interesting. If you think about it, this was successful. It sparked what we do today people coming together from different backgrounds and collaborating. What is collaborating? It's talking to one another. It's socializing. It's developing community. It's putting through the tough times. It's putting yourself outside your comfort zone to move forward, to get ahead, to understand that if you do these things, you can become more successful to the extent at which you can collaborate with people and deliberate on different ideas, the more successful one might be able to be. That's the promise of the Bauhaus method. What is it that I have you guys do in this class? It's coming up with ideas based off of general context, getting together to collaborate and, and um, deliberate on ideas, restructure those ideas, and then visualize those concepts, and then deliberate on the solutions of those concepts. The, to the extent at which you guys are putting in the effort towards this um, community um, collaboration is going to make you more successful. It's not just in this class, but also the department. How are you working with other people? Also, uh, other departments. How are you bringing those ideas from other departments into this department, right? It, it, you need to really be thinking about that uh, and learning how to learn through that method, right? So even after school, 
how can you get these different ideas from different people, bring them together? So another, another aside, but um, as I very uh, specifically outlined here, it's a successful method that the whole world utilized. So, you know, take it for what you will, either you use it or you don't. Um, how successful do you want to try and be? So, um, yeah, so this notion of different movements, right? Um, as, as people uh, started to study these different aspects more and more beyond just this um, conversion of uh, power, the power struggle, we got into different things, uh, such as structuralism was one movement where uh, it wasn't really so much so visualizing um, different visual art. It was more of a cognitive theoretical approach to thinking about art uh, and ideas in general. So this is a very powerful um, concept of structuralism. Uh, and it kind of just sums up the movement. There's no language behind language with which we can understand it. So like no meta language. What is language? You're gonna retort and tell me what language is by speaking in language, right? So this, this notion of what are, what, how are things structured out became uh, a popular component in, um, you know, as, as a different movement. Then we got into other things like post-structuralism to kind of fight that structure. Uh, okay, so this is a very um, well-known painting. Um, and you can see the date, right? We're moving through time, 1928 to 29. So this is kind of like still, uh, well, this is like 10 years after the Bauhaus kind of started, right? So ideas are shifting and flowing and moving. Uh, and so this is a painting of a pipe. And if I asked you, what are you looking at? Describe what you're looking at. Most people would say a pipe, right? Uh, but I mean, I would argue that you're looking at your computer screen, number one, or if, you're, if, I'm, if I'm asking you what you're looking at on your computer screen, uh, you might say, well, this is a painting of a pipe. It's not an actual pipe, right? An actual pipe you could touch and have it in your hand. Uh, so this image is actually, um, in French, it says, this is not a pipe, right? It's this notion that like, it's not, it's a, it's a, it's a painting, right? Um, kind of was another component of rethinking about these different rules that it had been structured out. And then we get into this postmodern movement where Again, similar to like the post-structuralism uh, um, we have artists trying to undermine the structures uh, and you know statements and concepts and theory that the uh, modernist movement had set up. So there's a variety of different artists working in this field. And this is specifically, where you guys probably have most of your understanding of art is more, more of the recent, um, recent um, stuff, right? If you go to museums, what's cool and hip, this stuff is getting dated, but it's still, um, it's still current in the sphere of things. So uh, this movement became, uh, began sometime in the 70s and introduced components, uh, um, not components, um, sub-genres such as intermedia, you know, like uh, multimedia, um, installation art, conceptual art. Uh, so, you know, thinking, um, Kind of beyond the box, so to speak, playing, really playing, challenging, what can art be? Right. So um, 
these are just different uh, grammatical uh, conventions to be using. So real quickly, um, the vocabulary, vocab terms, very simple fundamental components, line, shape, color, value, whatever, very building blocks. Uh, grammar, visual grammar is using the building blocks of vocab to build um, more of an understanding of how those components are coming together, okay? And so we have some examples here uh, for visual grammar. Two examples, top and bottom, right? Um, what would you classify the top? And what would you classify the bottom? If these were two different images, right? It might be easy to then guess that uh, this is based in balance. The top is a formal balance and the bottom is an informal balance. Uh, I mean, it's the only selection that has two components. Um, so the top is very well uh, aligned, very clear to read, um, very formal, right? The bottom, the image isn't even completely on the middle of the screen. We're cutting off some of it, okay? Um, and then like the subcaps is down at the bottom, very small. We don't even really know what we're looking at. Um, so uh, moving on, um, we have this one. Um, so what would this image entail? Is it talking about like emphasis on something, uh, movement on something? proportion. I mean, you could argue kind of anything really, but I think the most important thing here would be uh, unity and harmony. Uh, we're unifying the whole image together, utilizing similar content, right? Guitar related. It's an ad for like a pickup amp or something like this, right? For a rack. Uh, and then we have this image. Um, I would argue this one is based on movement. Um, and right where the movement is, right where all this color is, is where we have the title. So we're drawn to the color of the movement, right? And because we're drawn there, we're going to look at that text because also the text is the top left and the text is bold, right? It's easy to read. Um, but it's a good design to bring your eyes to that spot. It's um, using movement. And then uh, finally, this is just based on proportion, right? Dandelion flower is very small, but looks larger than her head. Proportion, right? Playing around with that. So these are just different terms to be thinking about um, as you work through your project, you're talking to each other, um, you know, basic fundamentals. So then, um, as we get into using uh, different fonts as well, right? We're gonna be kind of focusing a little bit on type for um, both the Illustrator and the InDesign components. And uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest component here to be understanding is the serif versus sans serif. Uh, it's a classification of the two different types of type, typefaces. Um, such as like, right, a typeface is like Times New Roman or Helvetica, if you watched the movie, you should have. Uh, those are typefaces. They are um, designed by someone and they have different designs, right, clearly. And um, let me maybe also bring up, I have one example to show you in a second, but uh, so sans versus sans serif, this should be a pretty clear cut, uh, quick example, if my internet would load. Okay, so serifs just have these little feet on the edges, uh, and, and sans serif does not. So you can think of the serif as the actual flaring components. And uh, the way I like to remember it too is more traditional, I suppose, is uh, like, why are these a thing? 
yeah, it's kind of ornamentation, but like, why, how did it become a standard? Well, what's the first place that type was used? If you think back, most, most civilizations, it was stone. So if you're carving letters into stone or symbols into stone, uh, as you, as you're hammering with a chisel and hammer or <laughs> hammering a chisel, uh, into these grooves, once you come up, you're going to be oftentimes you're going to be popping out additional uh, components of that stone. So just over time, they embedded it into the structure of the type. So uh, in your final layouts, you will be using uh, both a serif and a sans serif. You'll need to use two fonts and you'll need one of each. So it's up to you to decide what works well for your um, your particular design. And then uh, we'll get into some other stuff like letting, kerning. Um, those are kind of like alignment and, st and structure of using type. Um, Apple has a program called Font Book. And if we just go up to the search here and search for Font Book, uh, it just comes right up. And you can see all the fonts on my entire computer. Um, I don't, I don't know if this is, um, I honestly don't know how Adobe manages fonts. So I don't know if this is, I don't think this is with my Adobe subscription. Um, but I believe you have access to all of Adobe fonts in all of your Adobe programs. So, uh, you guys should have access to that. I, I had to figure that out last semester because technically uh, it's a service. So it had to be activated through the department. Um, but so as you go on, if you don't have enough fonts here that you like, um, Adobe actually has um, this page that you can go in and see what fonts are um, um, not signed in, classic. You can go scrub through all of the uh, fonts that are available to you. through that account. Uh, okay, prove that. I think I'm just slow because I'm currently streaming my video to nobody. Okay, so here, this is Adobe. And um, I believe it works. I'm not sure how it works through the lab and that sort of thing. Um, but as we, get in, as we get into using um, InDesign, this would be the most important area to be using the type. And uh, once you download it and install it, hopefully you can do that with uh, lab computers. Um, you could, will then be able to package your type so that if you move computers, um, you can bring uh, that, that typeface will be in the package um, you bring to other computers. So font book um, is a way to use typefaces outside of Adobe. So if we were to go on to some random, random website and search for free fonts, uh, I don't know what's good, whatever. You might have to make accounts and that sort of thing, but you can find different fonts in different places and, um, you know, download. I don't, well, actually, I don't think that that's, looks like spam, uh, but you can download free fonts. And then once it's downloaded, you just literally drag and drop it into your font book and that's it. Like you're able to then use it in, in Adobe. So pretty seamless experience. And then um, I'm wrapping up this video with uh, this other video. So it should play back fine, the volume you might have to adjust, but um, I'll screen it here. And then if I have any comments, I'll also point them out. So this is gonna get you um, in context with uh, why we're using Illustrator, this vector-based program um, for, uh, to, to what end for then bringing that into our uh, portfolio design. So as we watch this, I can uh, follow up in a second. Branding and identity are all around us on websites and product packaging, 
on different types of advertising, even on personal items like documents and business cards. Simply put, branding is what other people think about you, your company, your product, or your service. Okay. So um, this brings up the initial factor of uh, why we're using Illustrator. And we're going to be designing some sort of graphical component, right? That you will then be using on your portfolio to showcase the works that you've made for this semester. So regardless, uh, you know, of Illustrator, we're, we're doing this layout, two-page layout, which you're going to have your uh, three other projects represented, and uh, the audio project. You know, you could take a screenshot of your um, your audition, for example, and you'll also have your text there. So that's where we'll have like the text design come in. And um, the next lecture will have further details on designing the layout. But on top of the layout specifically, we're going to be starting here with creating a brand. Now, the brand itself um, sometimes really kind of happens after we've designed all the other components, right? Say we did like a poster, and then we need to do a website. And then we need to do a business card. The whole thing is like we'd start to make sure that all these components are similar, right? Just like that last slide of my, um, uh, the last slide of the keynote here is representative of my website style, right? Um, this is all essentially branding. Oh, I used to have my my logo here, but it um, didn't translate, I guess. So you, your case is going to be, and there's going to be a project description. I'm just giving you context. You're going to be designing some sort of logo, um, but it doesn't have to be a logo. It can be any sort of visual branding identity. Okay. Um, but specifically, you'll be designing it with vectors in Illustrator. Um, and preferably using type in that process. Not requirement, I don't think at this point, but um, we're gonna see how it goes this semester, right? Kind of leave it more open, but. Visual identity is what that brand looks like from your logo to your color choices and so much more. Strong visuals can be very persuasive Think of your own experiences as a consumer. Have you ever chosen a product simply because you liked the way it looked? Understanding visual identity can help you make more thoughtful design decisions, regardless of your role, medium, or skill level. Visual identity is kind of like a preview of your brand. Each part of your design is a clue that tells the viewer what they can expect. Your tone can be classic and refined, or a little more out there. No matter what, every element works together to show exactly what your brand is about. Of course, it's not all business. You can apply the concept of identity to almost any type of project, big or small. Whether you're updating your resume or looking for ways to enhance your website, there are lots of benefits to having a consistent visual style. Some companies use an actual style guide to keep their brand looking consistent. If you're just getting started with design, it's okay to take a more casual approach. The main components of visual identity are logo, color, typography, and images. A logo is what identifies your brand using a particular mark, type design, or both. The most effective logos tend to be fairly simple something viewers will recognize and remember. Every element of your logo contributes to your brand identity, including your font choice, colors, and other imagery. Change even one of these elements, and it can have a big impact on the way your brand is perceived. In practice, logos are everywhere. Look closely and you'll find them in corporate settings, 
as well as out and about, representing small businesses, freelancers, and other entrepreneurs. A logo is a lot like a literal brand. It's how people come to recognize you and identify your product or service. That's why it's important to use it wisely. A logo that's pixelated, distorted, or too small to read could give viewers the wrong impression. Keep a master copy that's sharp, high quality, and big enough for any project. That way, you're prepared for anything that might come along, whether it's a simple print job or something else entirely. Color helps define your brand in a very powerful way. Not only does it make a strong impression on the viewer, it also creates a sense of unity when used across multiple projects or platforms. Most brands derive their main colors directly from the company logo. Additional colors can help you expand the main palette and further define your brand's personality and style. There are lots of ways to use brand colors. Just be careful not to go overboard or ignore basic design standards. Avoid common pitfalls like colors that vibrate or threaten to overwhelm your design. Make sure to include neutrals in your color palette like black, gray, white, or off-white. Text is one of the simpler aspects of identity, but it can be surprisingly expressive. All it takes is a different font, and you can subtly, or not so subtly, change the entire look of your brand. Most brands choose two to three fonts, often inspired by the logo, for basic everyday use. Creative fonts should also be chosen with care and should be a reflection of your unique visual identity. There are certain fonts that professionals know to avoid. Fonts that were once popular, but are now considered outdated and overused. When in doubt, a more timeless, understated font is less likely to detract from your message. Your font choice should complement your brand, but still be current and professional. Images are a huge part of building a unique identity. Every photo, graphic, icon, and button is a chance to showcase your brand and shape the way that it's perceived. In professional settings, images are usually created specifically for the brand. For instance, pictures in a catalog or graphics in an app. Beginners can get similar results by choosing images with a subtle through line, like a signature color, a shared subject, or a consistent graphic style. Most importantly, avoid images that feel generic or obviously staged. This is difficult if you're relying on third-party stock, but there are ways to set your brand apart. Avoid images that lack context or appear frequently in other brands' designs. Instead, choose images that seem genuine and feature authentic people, places, and things. Visual identity isn't just a marketing tool. It's a way of looking at design that removes a lot of the guesswork. With a clear vision of your brand, you know exactly what colors, fonts, and images to use. You can create consistent works that viewers will remember. Thanks for joining us for the basics of branding and identity. Check out. Okay. And I used a lot of, uh, a lot of these in the next video too. So I think, um, you know, after recapping this, I haven't watched this since the last term, but we didn't have this project last term. Um, I think it outlined a, a good, where are we at? Visual style. To keep their brand looking consistent. If you're just getting started with design, it's okay to take a more casual approach. The main components of visual identity are logo, color. Right here. So I think that um, I'm going to have you guys focus on these, I believe, four components for your uh, illustrator branding um, campaign here. So you'll be creating some sort of like identifying logo, uh, your brand identity, right? 
And um, based on that, we could then use those colors and branch out to um, enhance and kind of like articulate, uh, guide you in your um, setup of your layout. So I'll uh, let this play through. So these four components will be focusing on for your illustrator drawing for your project. The main components of visual identity are logo, color, typography, and images. Okay. A logo is what identifies. So um, there are different ways to uh, utilize images in uh, Illustrator. So we'll cover that um, and how to simplify them down to utilize. We'll cover how to use type and um, obviously color. Uh, and uh, why am I blanking on the last one? Main components of visual identity are logo. Color. Logo. I mean, we're building the logo. So all of those three components are kind of going into the logo. So this first brand identity is based off of your logo. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, so that's it for this one. A um, little longer than I would hope, but I think it's good to be comprehensive. So especially since I'm not there to ask questions right now. So, all right. And then you can tune into the next one.